shake it. I was, I missed like a whole week of work and I just couldn't seem to get better. And I turned out that I had a stomach virus and then I was just getting better and then I got a cold. And because my immune system was already down, it just knocked me out. So it was terrible. So I am so glad to be feeling so much better. Um, take a look at this picture. What comes to mind when you look at this picture? Or what words or what feeling do you get when you look at this picture? It's so peaceful. Oh. Yeah. Solitude, peaceful, calm. I love these kinds of pictures. I had one of these in uh, when I had an office. I had one of these um, hung up. And for me, the word that comes to mind is contentment. Now, some of you already know I have three teen boys. Mm -hmm. My youngest one turned 14 this week. Uh, and my oldest one that was did the scripture reading, it's about to be 18. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so the word contentment is not a word that is common in my vocabulary, <laughs> you know, um, because it's more chaotic than anything else. But this week I was driving to work and I love that I commute. I commute about an hour because um, I live in Pennsylvania and work in Piscataway. And I actually love the drive. I've been commuting for like 20 years. And I like it because it's my time to kind of like prepare mentally and emotionally for what I have to do for the day. So it's my time to pray, it's my time to think about my blessings, it's, it's my time to sing when no one can hear me. <laughs> and, and so this week I was driving to work and the word that came into my mind was contentment. And this week as I was driving, usually when I'm going to present the message on Sabbath, my planning is done on my commute. So it's like I have all these thoughts and, and I don't actually write them down until like Friday evening or Saturday morning. But, you know, I've been thinking about it all week. So I was thinking about this word and then on Thursday was my son's birthday and we went out. And the word popped into my head again, contentment. I actually felt content. My kids were not fighting. It seemed like everything was just right in the world. And I was like, man, I really feel so blessed right now. Because I feel like I haven't felt that way in a really long time. And so this takes me to the next slide, which is something that I use when I feel like I am stressed and it's the word contemplation. So when I had the, the picture of the boats in my office and things would get chaotic or I would be talking to someone that was particularly difficult to communicate with um, and I felt stressed, I would just pause and take a look at the picture and just kind of like pretend that I was there. Mm -hmm. I would just kind of travel there. And I could like look at the picture for like a good 20 minutes, ignore everything around me, and just kind of like find my place of peace. It was something that I did to be able to calm myself down. But many times, this is what my brain feels like. Amen. Chaos. How many of you feel that? <laughs> if you're a parent, definitely. If you work, Probably. Um, different people have different types of chaos. For some, it's a to-do list. For some, it's the kids. For some, it's work. For some, it's household chores. And the list can go on and on. You know, sometimes there's just so much noise in our, in our minds, and it's really hard to quiet that. You know, you try to go to sleep, and you know, I, I really hate when I'm at a new job and I start dreaming about work. I feel like I'm working 24 hours because I just can't seem to like stop my mind from thinking. And it's exhausting. 
One of the things that I like is that we can learn so much from Jesus. And I want to take you to Mark. Mark 1, 32 to 34. One of the things that for me can be draining and chaotic is when there's a lot of, of my attention demanded. You know, when your kids are young, it's always, mommy, I need to go to the bathroom. Mommy, can I watch TV? Mommy, I'm hungry. You just had lunch. Mommy, I'm still hungry. Can I have a snack? Mommy, I'm tired. It, it's just never ending. Um, when you're in school, it's like, Miss, I don't understand this problem. Miss, can you help me? Miss, I can't log into the computer. And it's just constant demands of your attention. And Jesus, when he was in his ministry, his attention was always demanded for. And when we look at Mark 1, 32, it says, At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in ministry or anything that's related to working with people. But when you work with people, it's exhausting. It's emotionally draining. It just takes everything out of you. So I can just imagine how Jesus, you know, his attention was being called for left and right. People that were sick, you know, their children were sick. People that had the, the demons and they were being tormented and just everywhere. People wanted Jesus to help them. And so when we find ourselves in a place of chaos, what do we do? And this is where Jesus teaches us what we should do. This is what he did. So the first thing is find a quiet spot. And in Mark 35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. There have been times when I needed to get myself to a solitary place. And that could be as far as my bathroom. <laughs> you know? Um, it's whatever works for you. Occasionally, I could go to a park, you know, and, and somewhere a little bit further away, but sometimes I do need to find that quiet place, you know, where I can just breathe and think about, you know, the good things that I have and the blessings, because those are the things that encourage me and uplift me. And so this is what Jesus did. He got up really early and he went to a solitary place because he needed that time to recharge. And then what did he do there? <laughs> he prayed. Prayer is so powerful. I have, um, my youngest son is quite a challenge. He keeps me on my toes. And the only thing that ever helps to calm him down is prayer. Sometimes I have to just not talk, go to my room, get on my knees, and pray. Pray for wisdom, pray for guidance, pray for my son. Many times he doesn't want to go to church. I pray so that he can have the desire, the motivation, and then he's like, wait, mom, I'm going to church. You know, and then he's running out the door with like all of his clothes in his hand and his shoes. Just dashing into the car. Okay? He made it to church. You know? Prayer works. Prayer is powerful. Um, sometimes I have to have meetings with not pleasant conversations with parents. And, you know, I pray, and it turns out to be a very pleasant conversation. Because that is how we get our wisdom. That is how we are renewed. That is how we communicate with God, and he's the one that gives us the peace that we need. So sometimes when the chaos is too much, it's difficult to be able to pray. 
And I think about spiritual contemplation. I want to take you to John. Sixteen thirty-three. It says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I will overcome the world. Sometimes when I can't think about positive things, or when I find that I just don't have words, I meditate on God's word. So this is one of those verses where it's a promise, you know, He's not telling us that we're not going to have problems. We're going to have problems. But he says, be of good cheer. He already won those battles for us. So why do we worry? You know, and so something like this is something that I can repeat, you know, in his word. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so if you can have that time of quiet, you know, and you, you really don't know, you don't have words, find a promise. Find a promise and just read it over and over because it brings you a peace, a peace, that kind of peace that surpasses all understanding. But then sometimes we're in our moment of prayer and I don't know, it, doesn't, it probably doesn't happen to you guys. But all of a sudden you realize that you fell asleep. I'm, I'm sure that doesn't happen to you. You know, you had a really, really, really long week. And you come to church and the prayer is a little bit long. And then you find yourself daydreaming or maybe taking a little nap. You know, and it's like, wait, I gotta come back. I gotta focus. And... Something that I was uh, talking with my students this week, and I find it in Romans. Romans 8, 26 to 28. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So it's okay if you don't have words. It's okay if you don't know what to pray for. It's okay if you come up with a blank, because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf. What we need is to have a heart that's ready, a heart that is willing to accept, a heart that is willing to want the Spirit to intercede for us. And this can happen when we are in the midst of chaos, but we can rely that God knows what we're going through. And that's why he has a Spirit that can intercede for us because he knows that we were gonna need it. And so, sometimes this is not a priority. You know, we, we, we get into the busy, busyness of life. Um, I myself, I, if I had uh, an addiction of choice, it would be workaholic. Mm. I would be a workaholic. I have to say I am a recovering workaholic. Mm. Um, when I was um, younger, in my teens, I was a college student, and I worked at a summer camp. And I was a director for seven years there. And my first couple of years, this is, this is the typical of how my day would go, okay? I would wake up in the morning, okay? Now, we would stay in cabins, and the outhouse, I don't know if you guys are familiar with tranquility, but the bathroom is at the top of the hill. And so I would get my toiletries, my towel, and I would say, okay, I'm gonna go to the bathroom, take a shower, get ready for the day. But before, we start with like staff worship. So the plan was, before breakfast, after staff worship, I was gonna make it to the bathroom, okay? So we have staff worship, now it's breakfast time, I'm on my way to go to breakfast, next thing you know, 
this, this kid needs help, this counselor has a question, this parent's on the phone. Next thing you know, I'm late for breakfast and I still haven't made it to the bathroom. So I go and I have breakfast and I'm like, okay, after breakfast, I'm gonna get to the bathroom, I still have my stuff with me. And right after breakfast is over, you know, that's when everybody breaks up for the activities. And so it's like, we need this opened. We need a key here. We need a radio here. Um, where is this counselor? Where is this instructor? And it's just on and on and on. Next thing you know, it's almost lunchtime and I still haven't been able to take a shower. Um, eventually, before lunch, I make it to the shower. And then after that, it's lunch. And then the rest of the afternoon, Similar pattern, you know, it's always summer camps. If you've ever been one or sent your kids to one, you know that it's packed full of activities. And so we have evening worship, and after worship, the evening routine. It's about midnight to one in the morning where I finally get to go to my cabin. There's no showering, there's no evening routine, there's first on vertical and then I'm horizontal, and then I'm out to repeat the next day. That's how exhausted I would be. And so typically, um, around, we would have four weeks of camp. Um, around the third week, this was the pattern, I would get really sick. Fever, body chills, you name it, I had it. Sometimes ear infections came with it. And so I'm like, no, I can do this. And I would push through, I would keep working because I felt like, you know, summer camp was gonna be, was gonna end if I wasn't there, you know? Um, so eventually when I just couldn't function anymore, I would end up in the hospital. Mm. And this was every year, same pattern. And you know what the doctor would always tell me? He said, you're sick because of stress. Mm. It's like, you need to just rest. And see, I'm really, really stubborn. I've learned along the way not to be so stubborn. But if I need a break, I don't give it to myself. God has to basically tell, like, give me the break. Amen. You know? It's like, you know what? You are going to get so sick that you just have to be in bed. Amen. Which is basically what happened, this, you know, two weeks ago is that I was so sick, but you know, you keep working, you keep pushing, and then you, you, you're not good for anybody. And so these are the things that sometimes, you know, we put ourselves last. Amen. And we don't put ourselves first. But we have to be able to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. Because we cannot preach out of emptiness. We cannot give what we don't have. And so if we want to help others, if we want to serve, if we want to minister, if we want to be a good parent, we are the most important person. And so that time with God is so important. It's crucial. It's about self-care. I've had, um, I've worked for the last four years approximately with all kinds of therapists, counselors, uh, that help with my kids. And the one thing that came out the most was that I had the tools to know what I had to do, but I wasn't taking care of myself. And so when you don't take care of yourself, what happens is that you become irritable, you become more explosive, you know, every little thing, you just don't tolerate it, you don't have enough patience. And in the sake of trying to always be there for your kids, you're actually not being a positive person in your kid's life. And so my goal um, for the past year has been to really be intentional about slowing down and really taking care of myself. And for me, that means spending time in the Word and being able to have that communication, that regular communication with God because my days, I am a guidance counselor and a teacher, and they go from meeting with students all the time with all kinds of problems, and then I come home and I have my own children, you know, and it's nonstop. But yet this week, it was so nice that I felt content because I have been taking care of myself. And it 
life is just so much more pleasant when you put yourself as a priority. And pleasant for you and pleasant for everyone around you. Um, what are the challenges for us to be able to take care of ourselves? And for everyone, it's different. For some, there's noise, different kinds of noise. Disturbances, time, time is always a challenge. I used to always use that as an excuse. I don't have time. I have so many things to do. That's not true. Because the things that are important to you, you make time for. Amen. And you need to make yourself important. And part of that is setting the time each day to have that, that time with God, to be able to just pray and just quiet out all the noise. No telephone, no children, no spouses. Just, it's just you and God. And being able to be renewed. Just like Jesus went away. He went away to take his time. And the thing is that the disciples, they came searching for him. Like, where you been? What are you doing? People are asking for you. Just like Many times when we want to try to get away, people Amen. come and say, like, what are you doing? Mom, where are you going? Amen. We need you here. Yeah, well, I have an appointment with me and my God. So, you know, sometimes if we show people that that is a priority, eventually they will respect it. Yes. You know, so now my kids know that if my door is closed and sometimes I'm sitting at my desk and I just have my Bible, it's like, don't disturb them. And that is, I think, a bigger lesson to them than us actually speaking the words of, you need to have a relationship with God. You know, it's leading by example. Amen. And so these challenges, they're only challenges because we make them challenges. But they don't have to be a challenge. And if we want to really have that renewed strength, we need to focus on the promises and focus on the, the example that Jesus has left us. So what, what do you do? You schedule your meditation time. I live by my calendar. JD knows this. <laughs> Can you do Trevor's story on this day and it's like two months away? It's like, hold on, let me check my calendar. <laughs> I have like a year in advance planned out. You know, um, one time I heard, you want to know what a person's priorities are? Look in their calendar, you know? And that tells you what is that person's priorities. And so I did that and I went to my calendar and I realized that I was not a priority and my kids were not a priority. Everybody else was a priority. And I decided that I needed to change that. And not to say that I have completely accomplish that because we always go back to our old habits and it's something that we have to be intentional about. But being able to make that a priority, you know, scheduling yourself 25 to 30 minutes and actually putting it in your calendar so that it's there. And it's important just like your deadlines at work, it's just as important as your responsibilities in church, it's just as important as any other demand that is asked of you. And one of the things for me is that it's, I love being in nature. And nature is very healing. Um, well, I sometimes go backpacking, and I remember this one time I was, we were just walking on the ridge of a mountain, and we were just walking. And I felt that contentment. It was a Sabbath, and I wasn't in the Bible, I wasn't in church, I wasn't technically worshiping, and yet I felt like I was in God's presence. And it was a feeling that is just something really difficult to explain unless you've experienced it. But it's just this peace and this awe and this awesomeness of seeing what God created for our enjoyment. And so take time to go out, whether it's winter or summer or even raining, 
and enjoy the outdoors. The benefits of this is that, this is, this is a quote from a book, one of the main benefits of meditation is that it increases one's resistance to negativity, which results in a reduction of one's reactivity to former stressors. If you think about this, we are surrounded by negativity everywhere we go. But if you are right with God, if you are always meditating, you know what, people around you could be negative all day long and you will be the most positive person around. And actually, sometimes that upsets people because they, you know, misery loves company. And they're like, why are you so happy all the time? That's okay, let them be, you know, mad because you're happy, as long as you're happy. You know, contentment is a happiness. It's this deep joy. And so, I want to end with the verse in Matthew 8. Because the idea of this is not in any way that our problems go away, because they don't. And it's not in any way even that the chaos goes away. But if we go to Matthew 8, 23, it says, now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? The thing is that chaos will still be there, the problems will still be there, none of that has changes. But when we have a connection, we change. We can be in the middle of chaos, but we will be at peace. Just like Jesus was at peace in the middle of that storm while everyone else was a mess. And so make yourself the most important. Make your relationship with God the priority. I challenge you to make it intentional so that you can feel that renewed energy to be able to handle life. May you have a blessed day. Amen.